Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm Houston. I'm a software developer on the search infrastructure team at Bloomberg. And here I'm going to talk to you today about running solar on Kubernetes. Um, just kind of a brief intro of Bloomberg and what we do. Um, we are the largest uh, private uh, provider of news and business information around the world. Um, we power uh, tools that help finance, finance government, and uh, lo uh, law professionals um, throughout the globe and at a very large scale, uh, having to deliver kind of high-performance applications that scale and are reliable due to the customers that we try to support. Um, this kind of leads into the search infrastructure team. We just manage a lot of search infrastructure at Bloomberg because of the amount of data and kind of the reliability that our customers uh, kind of rely on. Um, and so because of the scale, you can imagine that running all of these thousands of search uh, engines would become kind of cumbersome and lead to a lot of mundane activities that you don't really want to have to deal with. That kind of gets into our talk today. Um, we're going to first kind of give some baseline knowledge about kind of managing solar clouds and a Kubernetes introduction. I'm sure that a lot of you all kind of understand how solar clouds are managed and kind of the basics of Kubernetes, but please uh, kind of deal with uh, the introductions because I want to get everyone on a baseline knowledge before I kind of talk about what we've built and uh, the solar cloud operator that we've open sourced that I'll end with. Cool. So mag managing solar clouds. At Bloomberg, we manage solar clouds at a very large scale. We have thousands of search uh, engines managing tens of billions, fifties of billions of documents daily. Um, and so basically, there are two different ways that we manage our search infrastructure and basically two different ways of managing solar clouds. There's the physical management as well as the logical management. Physical management is where does data live, what processes are running connected to Zookeeper creating these solar clouds. And the logical management is what is the data that is in these solar clouds? How is it broken up? What is the schema defined? These kind of things that you normally think about when using search as a kind of consumer instead of as a provider. So first, I'll kind of dive into what this physical topology that I mentioned before is. Um, basically, this is your infrastructure. This is your list of servers or virtual machines that are running uh, Java processes that are running solar cloud. These solar clouds are connected to Zookeeper, and they are storing solar cores, which is just parts of the solar index that you're using to search. Um, next, you have the logical topology. This is the other side of how you manage the data. Um, here, data is broken down into collections, which is just a logical grouping of documents that have the same schema and that you can do common operations on. These are further broken down by shards, which are kind of um, logical splitting of the data so that it can be uh, replicated. And so solar shards can only store up to 2 billion documents. So at some point, you need to add shards to your collection in order to store kind of large amounts of data. Replicas are kind of the last level there. And this is a copy of a shard's data that is uh, replicated as many times as you want just to add in resiliency to your solar cloud. And this is basically how um, our logical and physical topologies meet. They house solar cores, which is just a copy of the index. So as I mentioned before, this is our logical topology. And so basically, if we take away the clouds and sh uh, the collections and shards, we are left with just replicas. We can shuffle these replicas around however we want, and they just remain replicas. Once we bring up the physical topology layer, you can see that the server and solar nodes view, which is the physical topology view, is basically just a reimagining of the same data so that um, it's seen in a different way. So these, man these topologies are managed in very different ways. Um, logical has a much better kind of set of defined APIs and commands within solar that lets you manage it. Physical is a little lacking. Um, so with the logical topology, you get a lot of implicit features in Solar. This is through the auto-scaling component, which lets you add, remove replicas based on load and other things, as well as time-routed aliases, which based on the data within your collection, spins up new collections or deletes old ones if you don't need that data anymore, or you have like new data coming in with newer dates that you want. 
There's a lot of also explicit APIs provided by the collections API that lets you manage this logical topology, such as CRUD operations about around collections, replicas, and shards, creating them, splitting them, and so on, as well as um, kind of managing your schemas in these collections as well. The physical side of the topology, um, this is like dealing around servers, solar nodes, solar processes. This has a far kind of sparser um, API set. So you're able to do a, few, a little amount of uh, auto-scaling, which is shuffling replicas or cores across solar nodes, as well as a couple explicit uh, commands to the collections API, such as removing a node, migrating a node, which just migrates all the cores from one solar node to another solar node. But in general, there's not much there. And so when you're running thousands or even just hundreds or dozens of solar clouds, doing this physical management of solar clouds can take a lot of time and a lot of energy that you don't really want to spend. And so that kind of brings us into the next section of our talk, which is Kubernetes. Kubernetes is basically, if you haven't heard of it, an open source framework that allows for scheduling and operating of processes in a cloud platform, a generic cloud platform, basically letting you see your set of servers as one giant machine that everything is running on, sharing volumes, and so on. And we'll get into kind of what is Kubernetes in a little bit, but uh, basically you can just see it as a giant machine that you're running all your things on, and a, it's kind of permeated throughout the industry now. All the ma major cloud providers kind of support it natively, as well as kind of provide custom interfaces within it to make the experience better. Um, it's kind of important to mention that in Kubernetes, applications are run in a declarative fashion, meaning you give some set of configuration telling Kubernetes what you want your what you want it to run, and then Kubernetes makes that state happen. But as uh, kind of alongside that, there's uh, kind of ways that you can have automated processes that uh, manipulate this set of configuration as well, which kind of adds a lot of uh, power within Kubernetes and lets us do things such as manage solar cloud within it, and we'll get to that later. So just kind of establishing some terminology. This technology, we like to overload terms. Um, there's two terms here that are used within Kubernetes and Solar that I kind of want to get uh, out there. So Node. Node is used in both Solar and Kubernetes. In Solar, I've used it a couple times already. It means it's a solar, uh, solar cloud process that is running and connected to Zookeeper. It can house cores, issue quer uh, respond to queries and indexing. Um, but in Kubernetes, it means something very different. This just means a, like a server or a virtual machine that is running within a Kubernetes network. Replica is a little more similar between the two. In Solar, we've already kind of defined it. It's a copy of one shard's data that houses the Solar core. But in Kubernetes, it means an instanti instanti instantiation of a pod specification. Uh, and we'll kind of get into what that means in a little bit. So I'm going to kind of give you a kind of introduction to Kubernetes and the things you can do in it. Um, we're going to start with the low level um, kind of objects that you can create and see how they all build up on top of each other. So I'm assuming a lot of y'all have used containerized services in the past. Containers such as Docker are just kind of a way of isolating an environment and running a process within an isolated environment. It helps you um, kind of tell what your dependencies are, load them in beforehand to make sure that even no matter what is running on your server, you can make sure that the correct things are running uh, for your application within this uh, Docker container. Pods are kind of an abstraction on top of containers and manage a lot of the um, networking volume or like data management around them, as well as kind of help uh, make a consistent interface depending on uh, what kind of container you're using, be it Docker, be it Rocket, be any of the other ones. And so basically, it also lets you add health checks in to make sure that no matter what kind of container you're running within your pod, it has a kind of standard way of knowing whether that container is healthy, whether it's died, um, any of these common operations. So that's nice. But whenever you're running lots of these pods or lots of these containers, you want to make sure that if your pod dies, it comes back. You don't want to just have to manually listen to see, oh, my application stopped working. Let me go and spin that back up again. 
replica sets are the way that Kubernetes kind of allows you to build in res resili resiliency around pods so that um, it, you can make sure that in a in set of your pods are running at any given time. So whenever, say, a pod dies or goes, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> whenever a pod dies or goes down um, and the pod is deleted, the replica set will make sure that a new pod is scheduled and ran whenever that happens. So at any given time, you can expect, say, six of your pods to be running. So that's nice. However, it doesn't really do everything you want. Say you want to upgrade your pod to run a new version of your software. You don't want to just upgrade all of your pods at the same time. You want to upgrade in a very safe fashion, say a rolling upgrade. Um, deployments are a way that Kubernetes lets you do this. It basically manages replica sets. As you can see, we're just kind of building on top of each other here. Replica sets manage pods. Deployments manage replica sets. And so it will spin up, uh, whenever you want to deploy a new version of your application, um, deployments will spin up a new replica set and uh, very safely delete and add replica, uh, pods one by one from these replica sets. So at first, it will start to bring up a new pod in the new version of your replica set and bring down one pod in the previous version. If that doesn't work, it, the upgrade will stop and you'll still have two pods available in your previous replica set. However, um, if it does work, uh, the deployment will continue trying to increase the amount of new pods you have and decrease the amount of old pods so that your upgrade works kind of flawlessly, seamlessly, and so you don't really have to manage anything about um, making sure your upgrades are safe and reliable. And um, kind of a thing to note here is that even though the old replica set no longer has any running pods, Kubernetes will keep it around just in case you want to roll back versions of something bad happened in your new uh, kind of software upgrade. So that's nice. We can now kind of consistently run managed applications in a safe and consistent way. However, while Kubernetes gives us kind of like nice tooling around this, Kubernetes is not a fix-all solution for all of your problems. There are kind of give and takes, and networking is one of those big give, I don't know, which, one of the give or takes. Um, so basically, networking is not necessarily easier within Kubernetes than outside of Kubernetes. And so services are one way which Kubernetes has kind of tried to introduce um, basic networking within um, this framework. So as you see before, we have our deployment, which maps to a replica set, which isn't shown, and that's eventually mapped to pods. Services are a way of kind of letting pods be addressable. So you have all these applications running, say that they're HTTP servers, you want to be able to reach these pods from other pods. And in Kubernetes, due to security reasons, pods aren't addressable. You aren't able to just reach a pod directly. You have to go through something that's called a service. And so basically services are there just to provide a mapping from a DNS namespace, a, a DNS or a uh, IP address to a set of pods. And services are given a mapping of pod, like a pod selector, which basically tells you which pods to map to. It doesn't have to go through deployments. You can just be running your own individual pods, and services will still work with it. Uh, we just manage it via deployments because that's generally what's done. And so basically, you can also create another pod selector give, with a new service, service B, that overlaps with some of the existing pods um, that are mapped to be a service A. This uh, is very useful, as we'll see later in the presentation, when creating our solar cloud. Um, but the important thing here is that um, pods can be, pods are uh, they can be mapped to by multiple services, no services, one service. They don't really care. Uh, the services work on a different layer and just provide basic networking. However, services only really work within a Kubernetes cluster. So a, a client traffic cannot really hit services from outside the cluster. This isn't always true. You can use load balancing services, um, but this kind of is dependent on the cloud provider that you run Kubernetes in, and if you run it on bare metal hardware, it doesn't really work as well. So there's another product that Kubernetes kind of offers, which is ingresses. And ingresses are a, another application that's running inside Kubernetes and listens to client traffic coming from outside Kubernetes. And once the client traffic hits this ingress controller, you have defined rules on how to route that traffic. 
Um, it's important to note, ingresses only work with HTTP traffic. They don't work with base TCP or any of the other standards. And so you get kind of, uh, because it's HTTP, you can do kind of complex routing. You can do routing based on host name. So host one is routed to service A, host two is routed to service B, or you can do uh, path level routing. So um, host three isn't mapped to anything. You start looking at the path, and we see that API v2 is routed back to service A. So much like services, uh, ingress rules can map to multiple services or no services, but basically you have to provide a service for ingress to route to. You can't just provide base pods because net all networking within Kubernetes has to go through services. So I guess the question here is we have all these pieces of uh, infrastructure that Kubernetes provides us. Can we build a solar cloud with these pieces? Um, and once we start thinking about that, a, a few issues start to come up. Um, solar nodes, or we'd be running them in Kubernetes pods, have data that is unique to them. Um, this is not just the solar cores that they're running, even though that is unique to them and needs to be stored persistently. Um, they have a unique name and address whenever you start solar cloud up. Um, in Zookeeper, it, so, it stores its uh, kind of the address to locate it and the name that it's running under. Um, and whenever it restarts, it needs to have a consistent name and address for the other nodes in your solar cloud to be able to communicate with it. Um, and so the name and address and solar cores that are running uh, kind of need to be persisted through outages, through pod restarts, through any of these things. Um, and having any of them change whenever the pod restarts is kind of break solar cloud. So how are we going to deal with that? So there's a couple of rooms for uh, improvement with Kubernetes running stateful applications. Um, the workflow that we've defined already with these deployments, the replica sets, um, these services, they work very well with stateless applications, and you can think of the Solar Prometheus Exporter as one of these things, which just basically runs one pod, and it queries solar metrics and queries its other things and exports that to Prometheus. As you can see, that doesn't have any state associated with it, and it's very easy to run via deployments. Um, but these deployments for replicas that's really do have issues with the things that we were talking about before, which are data persistence and locality, um, kind of consistent naming through pod restarts and kind of consistent addressability as well. So what does Kubernetes provide us to be able to deal with these problems? Persistent data has a story in Kubernetes. The story is not perfect, but it exists. Um, there are persistent volumes in Kubernetes. So if you've used Docker, Docker has volumes that you mount in as directories or other environment variables. Um, and Docker, I mean, Kubernetes does have a way of kind of managing this. They have persistent volumes, which are a way of staying, storing persistent state. And there's a lot of different providers of these. There's uh, ones that are just storing local data on your box and on your server. But also Azure, AWS, all the big cloud providers have created their own persistent volumes to be able to use it within their ecosystem. Um, other kind of more open sourcey things, such as NFS, uh, I think uh, I can't CoreOS, a couple other ones have um, their own persistent volume uh, as, well, as well. But they all kind of implement this base persistent volume interface that Kubernetes kind of expects. Um, and a persistent volume claim is kind of coupled with this. So a persistent volume claim lets something within Kubernetes basically ask for a persistent volume resource, and Kubernetes will then find a persistent volume that has been registered in the same Kubernetes cluster and kind of link it to that persistent volume claim. So that when a pod that uses that claim restarts um, and when it comes back up, uh, the persistent volume will still be there and be able to kind of be added back onto the pod once it's restarted. So how is this used? So stateful sets are kind of a reimagining of replica sets. Replica sets were ways of managing in replicas of a pod specification. Stateful sets do the same thing. However, stateful sets do other things as well. They now kind of have a standard pod naming structure so that whenever a pod goes down and gets deleted, it comes back up with the same name, which is very important for things like solar, where we need consistent naming and addressability throughout pod restarts and kind of additional upgrades and stuff. 
And these persistent volume claims are then now set up natively with stateful sets so that you, uh, you pass, when you pass in the pod specification that you want to run, you also pass in a persistent volume claim that you want to run alongside these pods. And so as you can see here, uh, a pod, uh, I mean, sorry, a persistent volume claim is linked to each pod. And so whenever our pod went down earlier, the persistent volume claim didn't get deleted alongside it. It stayed, and it stayed linked to the persistent volume that Kubernetes gave it, so that when the pod comes back up, you can see that it has not lost its data. Our solar cores are still there, and they're still able to be indexed, which is nice. Headless services are, okay, so we've kind of dealt with these deployments of these stateful services, having data associated with these stateless services. Now we kind of have to deal with the networking part of it. So headless services are a way that Kubernetes has allowed these stateful applications to be able to individually address solid pods, I mean, sorry, not solid pods, Kubernetes pods within these stateful sets. So whenever you have a headless service, it gives a different host name for each pod in the stateful set. Um, this is just kind of services manipulating the DNS to just add entries for each pod. And so whenever the solar pod restarts, since the pod has a consistent name, um, the address for that pod will still stay the same since it's just the pod name dot service name dot namespace. So at this point, we have um, kind of consistent addressability, consistent naming, and persistent volumes, um, persistent storage so that Solar kind of can work more natively with Kubernetes. And um, but this does kind of introduce limitations. Headless services do have limitations associated with them. Um, they don't work with ingresses for one, so it doesn't really help us get data from outside of Kubernetes back into the Kubernetes cluster. Um, and they can also be used with load balancing, which is another way of getting uh, services addressed outside of the Kubernetes cluster. Um, so if we want to run our Kubernetes, I mean, our solar cloud, say, for in two uh, Kubernetes clusters or address our solar cloud nodes individually from outside the Kubernetes cluster, headless services don't really help us very much. So uh, why is this really needed? Why do we need to run uh, solar clouds across Kubernetes or have clients access it from outside of Kubernetes? Um, one, you want to be able to have staged rollouts of every piece of your infrastructure. And so if you want to have upgrade your Kubernetes cluster, Kubernetes uh, kind of deploys a new uh, update every six months, usually a big major release. And so it's kind of fairly common to see yourself upgrade your Kubernetes cluster. And so if you want to kind of have a staged rollout, you need to be able to have multiple Kubernetes clusters running your solar applications. And you want to have these solar clouds run um, kind of uh, the same solar cloud run in two different Kubernetes clusters talking across them. Um, sorry. These staged rollouts don't just include Kubernetes. They include other pieces of software running in Kubernetes. Um, so we're going to introduce the solar operator later. And whenever you're using the solar operator to manage your solar clouds, you want to be able to do a staged rollout of that, of that as well, which also requires multiple Kubernetes clusters running multiple solar operators. And in general, your applications aren't necessarily going to be run in the same uh, Kubernetes cluster that your uh, solar clouds are running in. And so if you want to use things such as the SolarJ client, I'm sure PySolar has similar capabilities. But generally, being able to address nodes, individual nodes from outside the Kubernetes cluster, we're not going to be able to use these headless services. So what can we do? There's two different ways we can do this. But in general, the solution is, unfortunately, you just need to create a separate service for every Solar node. And we'll kind of explain how this works later. But once you have a separate service for every solar node, there's two ways to make it addressable from outside. We create a load balancer within that service, which creates an IP address um, that maps to just that individual solar node. Um, or we create an ingress, which allows for a kind of more complex uh, routing of path and host name um, to that solar pod through a common IP address. Um, I will say, <laughs> at Bloomberg, we kind of uh, we like the ingress solution more because we don't like spinning up thousands of IP addresses because we run thousands of solar nodes within our company. So I, as I, because we like ingress more, all my solutions will kind of have ingresses in there. So just that's a caveat. Um, so as you can see here, we have our solar cloud running, and we have client traffic hitting it from the outside. Through an ingress, these ingress rules then map to different node, uh, services 
we have one common service that uh, routes to all the pods in our solar cloud. And then we have individual uh, services that map uh, kind of data and uh, user request from uh, to an individual pod within solar. So the node five, node six, and so on. Um, once we're using these individual node services, we can then have the individual pods uh, use the same kind of um, client request path to in, uh, address nodes themselves. So pod five would then, if it's doing peer sync with uh, pod six, would go back out to the ingress and have that uh, request routed down through the service and back to down to pod six. So this way we can run solar across multiple Kubernetes clusters and it will be able to kind of work natively um, and talk to pods within its own Kubernetes cluster, another one, um, and it doesn't really care which one it's running in. So how have we built the solar cloud in Kubernetes? As you can see here, at the bottom we have a stateful set. That stateful set has four pods running in it. These are our four solar cloud pods. Um, and then we have a lot of different services. These services are one each for all of our solar cloud nodes, as well as one common um, endpoint for all of our nodes together, and then a headless service that isn't really used for much. At the bottom, we have an ingress, uh, and this ingress has multiple hosts associated with it. Um, the basically the common service, uh, the common solar cloud host, as well as individual node hosts as well. This is how we route traffic into the Kubernetes cluster and into our individual solar nodes. So, running all these things kind of lets us build a solar cloud within Kubernetes. However, managing all of these different objects can become cumbersome, and as, you, as I mentioned before, we run thousands of solar clouds. We don't want to have to go and manually create these stateful sets, manually create these services, these ingresses, and so on, and have a whole management system for that. We want Kubernetes to be able to do that for us. And so, Kubernetes has these uh, objects called uh, custom, resource de custom resource definitions, which allow you to create um, objects within Kubernetes as if they were native to Kubernetes, such as deployments, services, stable sets, et cetera. And so these custom objects in Kubernetes can be anything. They can be Solar, Zookeeper, Kafka, anything we want to create. And then controllers are applications that are built on top of these custom resources that allow you to kind of listen to the API server in Kubernetes for changes in different, uh, like kind of updates, creations, deletions, different operations on instantiations of this custom resource definition. And then uh, the controller that can manipulate the other Kubernetes objects to make that state happen. Um, so say we have a solar cloud specification, the controller would then make sure that all of these things have been created um, once that kind of CRD has been pushed to Kubernetes. I'll pause so you can take a picture. <laughs> okay, so operators are nothing more than just a grouping of controllers. Um, they allow for common uh, kind of actions on a set of technologies. So for example, solar cloud, the solar cloud operator would have a solar cloud uh, controller, a solar cloud backup controller, a storing controller, um, these are just kind of the common operations and other technologies have more uh, kind of technology specific actions associated with them. So this specification that we've been talking about, the solar cloud resource that we've created has a more simple specification than some of the more mature um, custom resources out there. But um, there's more in there by kind of taking out the kind of unimportant things and left the ones that are really important. Um, basically, the main things you need to run solar are the number of solar nodes that you want to run, the version of solar that you want to run, and as you can see, we're just using the default uh, uh, Docker solar container that's published uh, in the most recent version, and then a zookeeper to connect to. Um, the solar cloud operator can create you a zookeeper in the cluster um, dynamically if you want it to, but it's kind of nice to have an external zookeeper that you know is going to be there and reliable that's not running in the same uh, kind of uh, cluster as your solar cloud is. And so here we pass it an external connection string as well as the ch root that we want solar cloud to connect to. Once this is done, solar cloud will create the objects, objects that we talked about earlier and return back a status. So CRDs have both a specification and a status. So once the CRD is created, um, it will basically populate the status section. It will tell you 
how to connect to the Solar Cloud via maybe Zookeeper at the bottom or just a URL at the top, as well as the Solar nodes that are running and the versions that they're running, the status of the Solar nodes, as well as individual connection strings for those nodes. And as you see here at the bottom, this cloud is currently doing an upgrade from Solar 8.1.0 to 8.1.1. And the status section will kind of tell you the status of the nodes through the upgrade. And so we have one node that has been upgraded, one node that hasn't been upgraded yet. Um, it seems to be working since the node that is upgraded is currently ready. So soon the last one will be upgraded. So I guess kind of finally, we have created the Solar Cloud Operator. Um, it's recently published as open source. Uh, we finally got it out this last Friday. So the builds are not necessarily working, but the code's out there. Uh, we would love contributions. Basically, we want this to be the way that Bloomberg runs Solar Cloud in the future, and that how a lot of companies that manage a lot of Solar Clouds uh, run them in the future. Um, these slides will be published at some point, and if you search Solar Operator, there's not a whole else lot out there. Um, I think this is one of the top results. Um, so we want as many contributions as possible. Um, Bloomberg is kind of big into making open source things so that we kind of contribute to the community and that everyone can have kind of the best way to run solar uh, as possible. So what is kind of the future of this project? Um, there's kind of a lot of things that we need to do. Um, the data, persistent is, data persistence is there, but in general, we don't have a good story around it. We haven't done a whole lot of testing around the local persistent volumes, which are still kind of in their infancy in Kubernetes. And we haven't done a whole lot of testing around the remote storage capabilities. Um, that will definitely be something that we start looking into this summer um, as we run more things in Kubernetes within Bloomberg. There's additional operator functionality that we need, such as backup and restoring, which we're definitely going to get around to this month. Um, and basically, a lot of the different operators around there have backup and restore capabilities that we kind of want to build in nat natively to the solar cloud operator. And we also want metrics to be provided kind of as easily as possible. So spinning up a deployment of the Prometheus exporter would be awesome to do alongside each cloud. We just need to kind of get that in there. So that's basically what we're doing and what we've done. Do you have any questions? Um, when you were talking about the ingress rules, uh, have you guys tried doing any routing based on collection name at the ingress rule level um, for like queries and updates going t directly to the correct node? A lot of running here. Um, so no, we have not currently done anything around that. That would be something that I would 100% be, um, I think that'd be awesome to add to the operator. Um, the, we have been working on some other things, but this is open source, so please help us if you want to um, have that in there. All the people in the back. If you're at the back, maybe walk a bit closer. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, y you mentioned uh, situations where a server dies or a pod dies or stuff like that. But um, w how do you tackle situations where the the service is not really dead? So it just has like some issues. It responds badly. It's it's taking long a long time to respond. It behaves unnaturally. And th these situations are more difficult to, to detect, and uh, they, there are situations where you actually need to kill the server and to start another one. And whoever wants to ask a question next should go right here. <laughs> That's a very good question, and I agree 100%. There's a lot of issues with solar that isn't solar dies. Um, these things are like OOMing, um, garbage collection issues, can't connect to Zookeeper, these kind of things. Um, the solar, I mean the, um, let me go back here. The uh, kind of pod specification 
lets you define different health checks and status checks. So these mean different things. And so you can define uh, health checks for your pods to say that if these things don't respond in the way that I want them to, kill the pod. But there's other things such as status checks. So if the, um, I don't, I'm not an expert in Kubernetes, let me start with this. So if any of y'all have corrections, I will take them. Um, so you can define like kind of more granular things there. So if the pods don't respond in a certain way, also kill the pod. It's not just like if this HTTP endpoint is available, keep it up and live. There's a lot more things you can do around that. And I think uh, given the different versions of Solar, Solar 8 has a better health check handler than Solar 7 and before, where it actually checks whether it's connected to Zookeeper and these different things, if the uh, cores are ready. Um, and so there's different things that we can build into the operator and different ways that we can manage this health. Hopefully that answered. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to give you two questions, and you can answer either or both, whatever you want. One is just about scaling limits, if you've run into any, or if you know, like, how big can you make each thing. And then the other question is about uh, if you've done anything about schema updates, you know, you need to re-index your whole cluster. Do you provide any support for that in the operator? So um, that thing blinded me. I forgot a lot. But um, the first question, I, I, I'll answer the second question. For schema updates and having to re-index your data, um, I'm not, I think that there's some JIRA tickets out there to make it better in Solar itself. Um, there's not a whole lot that the operator does for you there because this is, um, that's more of a um, kind of logical topology management system, whereas the operator is more of the physical side of actually kind of managing your nodes, your processes, um, not the schemas within. Um, that's not saying that we can't build it in there. Um, it's just not saying that it's currently there. And this is, once again, in its infancy, we want to make it a lot more powerful and solve a lot more problems. And I now remember the first question, scale. Um, so we've run solar clouds. We haven't done like a whole lot of scaling uh, with our operator, but I know that we've run within two, two Kubernetes clusters, 20 solar nodes each within the same cloud, so 40 total. Um, which is far more than we run, uh, not far more, that's basically what we top out at Bloomberg right now. So I know there's more of y'all that run thousands of solar nodes in a cloud and uh, hopefully you can help us test that, but I'm not sure how I'll do. <laughs> hopefully well. Okay. You have to go to the spot. Um, you mentioned on the last slide that the like potential or that remote storage might potentially be too slow. Um, which type of storage do you currently use? Because like what we noticed with Lucene based application on top of Amazon is that they work really, really fast if we use local SSDs. As soon as we run like a remote file system or something like this, performance is completely like one order of magnitude worse or something like this. So yeah, um, the reason I put the local persistent volumes in there um, before the remote storage is because we currently use local persistent volumes. Um, in general, they're not really implemented very well in Kubernetes right now. Um, I think they got in in the last two releases, so they're pretty beta at this point. Um, and we have not done any remote storage yet. The, I think we're kind of looking to do that for the backup and restoring right now. Um, but in the future, I don't see, I don't think that we're going to be running with anything other than local persistent volumes because. I mean, if you're using Solar, you want it to be pretty fast, probably. Um, we haven't done any testing with remote storage yet. We probably will, but I'm not expecting very much out of it. I can do this one. Uh, sorry, just yeah. last oh. Are there any particular versions of Solar that this would depend on, or are there any upcoming features in Solar that would benefit this? Um, yeah, so... Um, as I mentioned before, the like Solar has a better kind of liveness check in Solar 8 and beyond. Um, so, but I think this works with any of the Docker containers currently published, which I think is Solar 5, 5 something on. Um, I might be wrong with that. I, I know there's some 5, some 6, some 7, some 8. Um, yeah, we run it currently with 7 and 8. Um, I, I know that it works with those. I think Solar 8 has better liveness, as I said before. Um, but I'm not sure that there, I've not seen any features that 
kind of directly contribute to this. But I'm, I might be wrong there. Thank you all.